Good evening, everyone. I'm Kathleen Warner, the uh, director of Vermont Woodlands Association. It's nice to see you all here tonight. We've got a very big audience, um, a lot of people registered for this very popular webinar uh, with Alyssa Benna on bats. Um, I've, I've had lots of questions that have been emailed to me that I've forwarded to Alyssa. She very kindly answered some of those questions and uh, just this evening put a few additional slides in her presentation so she could address some of those questions that were coming her way. Um, so I, I'm not going to take our time talking tonight. I'm going to turn the program over to Alyssa um, and let her talk to us about bats. Great, thank you. And I'm told that <clears throat> sometimes turning off one's video when giving a presentation allows for a better transmission of information with the slideshow. So I'm gonna turn my video off, but keep my um, speaker on so that I can let you focus on the slideshow there. So I'm just gonna share my screen here. I'll just take a second to pop the presentation into slideshow mode. And um, if I can just hear a confirmation that you can hear me and see the first slide about habitat management. Yes. Excellent. Yes. Great. And um, I'm guessing in this format, it's easiest to save the questions to the end. So if you wanna jot them down or remember what questions you have to ask um, or put them in the chat, I think that's the easiest way. And <clears throat> so I'll run through some stuff here. The idea here is to communicate some information about bats, their biology, their behavior, their habits, and the habitat that's important to them. And this will um, mean that some of these things actually apply to one bat species, some apply to multiple bat species. There can be ways in which bats behave very similarly and have some similar needs. And then there can be some things that really separate them in terms of what habitat is really important or potentially a limiting factor for them and how they utilize that. And hopefully at the end of the talk, you will have a good understanding when you're walking through the woods or looking at your own home even, um, thinking about how habitat and what parts of habitat are important to bats and what you might be able to do to help be a part of um, their yeah. conservation. This is our mission here at the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. And I always feel like it's a big responsibility as a state employee working for the public to kind of, whoops, seems like for some reason there's an automatic slide advance, but I'm not sure why. I'll see if I can figure that out along the way. I haven't had that happen before. <laughs> My apologies if that happens. Um, we're supposed to really be um, conserving fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for all the people of Vermont. So um, it's, it's something that's put in our trust. And when we think about bats and why bats are important, one of the things that comes to mind is the fact that all of the bat species we have in Vermont are all insect eaters. And in fact, when a female is nursing and raising her young, she can eat her entire weight in insects every night. So that really adds up. And if you try to imagine what it would look like if you ate your weight in, in, in something every night, it might be a little similar to this. But you're flying and you're burning a lot of calories so you don't even feel guilty. In fact, if you're a bat, you need to put in a lot of fat to make it through the winter when you really don't have anything to eat. When we're thinking about what the benefit of all that insect eating adds up to, we're considering that bats are eating pests that are um, a problem for agriculture, forestry, or uh, gardening if you're gardening. So they eat cucumber beetles. There's evidence that big brown bats have eaten emerald ash borers, um, corn worm beetle, uh, sorry, corn worms that are from a, a moth that bats eat, stink bugs. So a variety of pests that bats are eating. And so they're creating this benefit to our forest and agricultural industry. And they do this in a couple different ways. A lot of you are probably familiar with the fact that bats use echolocation to what we would call hawk or go after individual insects in the air, like moths and large beetles, or they might fly into a whole swarm of insects. So they will take advantage of swarms like mosquitoes when they come out at the 
that early part in the evening, but they're really foraging on a variety of insects. And some of those species also use a strategy called gleaning, where they're actually picking insects off of trees. We know this because they have uh, evidence in their guano or droppings of insects that are not flying insects. And they've actually been seen using some passive listening to get insects off of trees. In fact, their echolocation is so finely honed that they can tell the difference in um, texture between the tree bark and the back of a beetle. Very incredible what they can see with their echolocation. And they have some interesting roosting habits. So bats tend to, I describe them as, as liking to pack in like sardines. So if you can find tight places for them to squeeze into, that's oftentimes what they're looking for. When we think of trees, we think of trees that are peeling bark in a roof-like pattern. On the left, we have a shag bark hickory. It's got a flag around it there, you can see, because this is actually a known roost of an Indiana bat. And that species is a favorite of them because they're looking for that exact type of structure. And on the right, you'll see a snag. And that snag, when it died off, has a lot of opening around it, letting some light in, which means some heat onto that roost area. And again, you have peeling bark and then other bat species, such as the northern long-eared bat, big brown bat, and silver-haired bat, love to roost in cavities. Bats also like to roost in rock crevices, talus, rocky ledges. The bats that we associate most with those features are eastern small-footed bats. So this is looking into a tiny little crevice, which is maybe about a half an inch, three quarter of an inch thick, between two large pieces of slate. And these are eastern small-footed bats. So if you can make it out, there's a little nose there with a furry head and two ears sticking out. And then you can see a bit of a forearm with a little red dot. They often have little mites, little red mites that are associated with them. And then there's actually another bat on the right. And I think my cursor usually works when I do that. So here's one bat nose, and then here's another bat nose. So they love to squeeze into those places. Big brown bats also like to use these types of habitats. But roosting is not the only thing important to bats when we think about their habitat. They also need a good place to forage. And depending on the species, they will be using the habitat in a variety of different ways. Many of our bats like to forage along the edge of a forested area and opening. They might be doing that over water where there's abundant insect activity or along narrow corridors in forested roads or even up and down roads that we drive. So taking advantage of that edge or even a closed canopy to protect them from aerial predators at night. They also use riparian zones along rivers and, and um, streams and will fly around ponds and wetlands. Those skid trails and hollow roads are important, not just for them to forage, but also for them to commute from their roost area to a foraging area. Mm. But some of our I other- Yeah, thanks. Like, don't keep assigning projects to me then. <laughs> So somebody's not on mute, I think. Someone talking about projects being assigned. If you can mute, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Um, so some species actually forage over the treetops as well, instead of taking advantage of those lower areas. And here's a great diagram that I found that really shows this pretty well, which is um, showing a variety of different species. And these aren't species that we have. This is a diagram that came from um, a, a British bat conservation organization, but it just shows you how different species are foraging in different ways. So you have larger species, which we have in Vermont being the hoary bat, big brown bat. Um, they tend to fly up higher above the vegetation sometimes um, on the top of vegetation. And then you have other bats that are flying really around and through vegetation. Northern long-eared bats are very famous for foraging on the forest interior, right dodging in and, about, in and out between trees. Um, and then others are really edge specialists like the Indiana bat. So when we think about bats, we also can kind of divide out ways in which they um, congregate. So all of our bats that go underground for the winter, our hibernating cave bats, which are six species, also happen to be species that tend to gather in larger groups in the summer in what we call colonies. And when they gather together, that makes them particularly vulnerable in whatever their gathering area is. 
So on the left, we see a tree with peeling bark and a nice crack in it. This would be a great roost for a variety of different species that love to squeeze in those spaces. And on the right, you can see a big old dead maple that is a tree that we tracked in Indiana bat too. And when we got there to that tree and counted bats, there were 84 other bats coming out of that tree with her in the spring. And we went back in the summer a couple years later following another bat who tracked us to the same tree for summer use. So these are really important sites that bats will sometimes use year after year in some cases. And um, they'll be highly concentrated in those areas. So you can see the importance to them. And this just gives you a view of what it looks like when you are lucky enough to be able to see a bat scrunched up under the bark there. It's pretty amazing. The problem is we used to have bats everywhere. In fact, some of the species that are in trouble now were really growing in population. Indiana bats were being considered for a potential downlisting from federally endangered to threatened. Little brown bats and northern long-eared bats were pretty ubiquitous throughout the state. We could catch them just about anywhere that we'd put nets up. But then white nose syndrome happened. And it's been over a decade since this disease came along, which is characterized by this powdery substance on the nose caused by the fungus that was really deadly to a lot of these bat species. Not just one species, but a whole suite of species that hibernates underground in the winter. And it causes really damaging skin um, tissue damage, which you can see here in this picture, this is not a normal bat wing. So this is a bat that's sick with the disease. And if they're lucky enough to make it through the winter with the fungus, when they come out in the spring and they try to heal, they're actually sloughing off large amounts of tissue and that results in sometimes them not even being able to fly. And they're usually dying of starvation and dehydration as well. So when we think about what these trends of population look like when the disease hit, you can think about this 2009 to 2010 period in Vermont as being the big plummet. So unlike a lot of other diseases or threats that might cause a gradual decline over time, White nose syndrome came in and just wiped out about 90% of the bats for a couple of key species, northern long-eareds, tricolors, and northern or, uh, little brown bats. And um, we're seeing continuing declines in some other species, such as Indiana bats. So here on the left, we see the total number of bats. And you can see these are small numbers because many of the sites that we have good long-term data for in Vermont are sites with smaller numbers of bats here but you can see that plummet. Some of these sites actually completely disappeared. There are no bats left there and others have seen some stabilization. And we don't go in those sites very often because we don't want to cause disturbance that could further threaten the bats making it through the winter in their fragile state. So when we think about what result white nose syndrome had on the populations that we have now, it meant that those declines were so precipitous and so obvious that uh, it was not difficult to make a case to add a few of these species to our own state endangered list. So prior to white nose syndrome, the Eastern small-footed bat was already state threatened and has always been rare. The Indiana bat has been federally endangered since uh, the 1960s and endangered in Vermont. And the Northern long-eared bat, little brown and tricolored were all added to our endangered list in Vermont. So the northern long-eared bat, in addition, also became federally threatened as well as state endangered. And these are our cave hibernating species. So that's where these bats go for the winter, except for big brown bats over here, which seem to have this great strategy of going into people's houses for the winter and potentially avoiding some of the effects of the disease. Over here, we have uh, on the right side, the silver-haired hoary and eastern red bat. And these are three species that are somewhat different they fly south for the winter. These are what we call our, our migratory tree bats. They're long distance migrators as opposed to the short distances the other species go. And you can see some key differences. You can see on the red bat here, how there's fur that extends all the way down the tail membrane. And that's true for all three of these species. In fact, in the winter, when they fly further south, they can still, even though they aren't really hibernating, they can still drop into torpor, which is like a bout of hibernation. They'll crawl under the leaf litter or find some place to hold up, and they're still able to reduce their body temperature and save energy in that reduced state when temperatures go below about 50. 
White nose syndrome has continued to spread. Um, I was unable to get a hold of the most recent map here. So this one's a little old. And what you would see in a more recent map is now there are some suspect counties around in states in a few of these other states and the disease has continued to spread further west in Texas, for example. Um, you can go to whitenosesyndrome.org. That's all spelled out. If you want any updates on the disease, if you want a lot more information, a lot of resources that I've helped to create are up there in the national website. And it's now in uh, 13 different species that the disease has been confirmed, 35 states, seven provinces, and the causative fungus, Pseudogymnoascus destructans, or what we call PD, has been found on an additional five species and in additional states. And the color coding here on this map is really just to show you the spread. So it originated here in New York, and then it spread down the Appalachians, and now it's moved across the country and well up into Canada. It's very difficult to try to understand what our post-disease trends look like. On the left, we have in the yellow square, the disease, or sorry, the population impacts when the disease initially hit. So if you look at the size of the square, the vertical size of the square, the height of the square of each fat picture, I put an arrow in here to represent approximately what the degree of that decline is. So for big brown bats here, it was about 35% initially that was measured from hibernation um, data. And northern long-eared bats, the trend looked like about 98% declines, whereas tricolors and little browns came in at about 90. Indiana bats only about 65, but they're continuing to decline. Over on the right in the green square, you can see that we're still trying to get a good understanding of what's happening with the population trends in the aftermath. For northern long-eared bats and tricolored bats, there are so few of those bats left, it's very difficult for us with survey data to really get a handle on what the population is or what that trend is. It's just the numbers are so small, it's really difficult to tell. Big brown bats are potentially increasing. We do capture them in locations where we had not before, so it's possible they're spreading out and taking advantage of some niches that have opened up. Eastern small-footed bats also are a nice, cold, dry hibernating species like big browns, and they did not fare badly from the disease and appear to be possibly increasing as we've seen the numbers go up at some of our underground sites for that species. That's always been rare. Little brown bats, on the other hand, are a pretty good story. They seem to have stabilized even after those 90% declines, and it's possible that over time they might be seeing a very, very small increase. So now that we have this perspective about bats, why they might be important to us in terms of eating insects, um, the, the major threat that a lot of them are facing right now, when we're thinking about what is important to them and what we can do to support what we would call bat health, we talk a lot about their habitat. And it's important to talk about these things because there are some times of year where bats are fairly vulnerable and there are some cases where some of that habitat is uh, somewhat limited. So we have to think about what our actions are, how we can avoid impacts to bats and how we can potentially help to improve their health so that the bats that are making it through the winter, even with white nose syndrome still, have the best chance they can of surviving and reproducing. When we think about maternity colony habitat, that is made up of a number of features. So for tree roosting species, they need trees, obviously. Talus cliffs, even quarry tailings piles are important to things like Eastern small-footed bats. Foraging habitat, as we talked about, is another element that they need. Travel corridors. So if we take a look at this picture in the Champlain Valley here, you can see open areas of agricultural land, and then you can see forested areas. But one of the important key elements between are these hedgerows. And these are very important because there are places where there's so much open area and bats may have a little hill that all of their roosts are located on, but the best foraging might be over in a wet area. And so they need to have connectivity between those two areas. Most of our bat species do not like flying across big open expanses where they're really vulnerable to their main predator, which is owls. So we find through a lot of great survey work that those corridors are really important for them, those connections. And hibernacula habitat. So in the winter, when we're talking about our threatened, oops, 
a threatened and endangered species, they go underground in the winter. And nearly all of those caves and mines, underground sites where they hibernate, are on private lands. So we completely depend on private landowners in most cases for the protection of those sites. That habitat conservation is something that's actually highly compatible with a lot of other wildlife habitat programs and management practices, whether that's participation through um, WIP, which I think used to be a QUIP or the other way around. Um, there's a forest bird initiative, there's current use program. So whether there are federal programs that you're participating in or the state's um, land use program, there are a lot of ways that you can integrate bats into that. And those can be as simple as retaining some uh, standing snags or even live trees with some cavities in them and just writing that into your forest plan in a way that is compatible with the other goals that you have. Some of the best management practices when we think about forestry in bats are to retain some mature trees. Indiana bats, for example, the larger the tree, the more likely it is going to be a maternity colony roost. Those bats just tend to gravitate to the really large diameter trees that are much more mature. Northern long-eared bats, although they use a variety of trees, sometimes have been associated with more mature stands as well. And some of that has to do with the fact that they have more features like cavities and peeling bark. Riparian buffers are very important. And uh, luckily this isn't something that we have to put on the agenda just for bats because there's a lot of great work in Vermont where those buffers are becoming really important as you can see in this pic picture here of making sure that those corridors are maintained. Bats actually can fly right up and down those uh, wet areas with the protection of the forested edge. Creating edge can actually be a great thing. And sometimes that means what you're doing is actually to stagger when you're creating openings over time. So we do this on our state lands where we will do some patch cuts and that will create some nice young growth, some young forests. And that's actually really beneficial to a lot of bat species to forage in because that young vegetation tends to attract a lot of insect matter. Unfortunately, what happens is um, if, you do a, if, if you do a lot of patch cutting, and, um, and that's your only focus, then you could be removing roosts. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, but you will be creating foraging habitat. So sometimes staggering those practices in a really sustained, a sustainable way over time is really the way to go. Um, and then as that habitat grows up, that young forest grows up, it then becomes um, pretty unsuitable for foraging for many of those bat species and, and it will be quite a number of years before it becomes roosting habitat because of the age class. So having a diversity of the age classes and species of trees is great for forest health and also really great for bats. And long range management planning is a great way to, to add some of these um, bat practices in. When we think about what our actions on the landscape can do in terms of direct impacts to bat, bats, um, if you are in an area like the Champlain Valley where the forested habitat is limited and you um, have Indiana bats living nearby, which is something that um, we can always help you figure out. Most landowners who have known roosts on their trees, um, all, of them, all of them know about that if we found the roost trees were in contact with people. Um, but uh, winter cutting is really the best way to avoid harming bats that are actually in a tree. So if you're going to be cutting down trees that have uh, the peeling bark, like the big live shag, shag bark hickories in the Champagne Valley, black locust trees with the really deep furrows, or trees with cavities and peeling bark, the best way to avoid potentially harming bats that could be in those trees would be to cut those in the winter. This picture on the right here is actually my dad. When, um, when I was growing up, he was a logger. And uh, he actually started with horses, cutting trees and dragging them out by horse and later ran a skitter. But um, that was definitely a big part of my life growing up was just being, being out in the woods. So one of the other practices um, to avoid take is uh, spreading those patch cuts out. And that means that when, when bats come back the next year, and this will be a little more obvious in, in a couple slides, when bats come back the next year, uh, there's a better chance that even if a few of their roosts are gone that were cut in the winter, that they'll find some other replacement roosts. And retaining any potential roost trees. And that just means trees that have those cavities, cracks, crevices, and peeling bark in a roof-like pattern. 
So here are some examples of what those look like. Here's a live shag bark hickory, which we saw before. And if you're gonna be retaining those, it doesn't mean you have to keep every one. It just means that if you find a, a pocket of those trees, for example, that maybe you shift one of your practices over a little bit to leave a couple of those troops, uh, those, those trees which are grouped together. Here are some examples of cavity trees. So in some cases, these are trees that are dead or dying. But in other cases, we have live trees where maybe a branch has broken off and a cavity is formed in. And you'll see that the crown of the tree is still pretty much intact. Crevices, so we have cases where there are splits in trees. Northern long-eared bats famously love to squeeze themselves into these places. And in fact, um, there are some other differences between bats in the way that they kind of microsite their roosts. Whereas northern long-eared bats like to be suppressed under the canopy in a more shady roost, Indiana bats tend to like a tree that has more solar exposure. So some ways that they are filling in the niches. Here's some more pictures of exfoliating bark. So sometimes it's on a live tree like the live shag bark hickory on the left, but sometimes it's on a dead tree. So we track Indiana bats back to old white pines, a lot of field pines, declining pine, um, dead elm and ash trees are very popular for that species. But you wanna think of what a dry roost space is. So that means whether it's a cavity or it's peeling bark, if the peeling bark is um, peeling in a fashion that does not create a roof or a safe dry space for the bat, there's less of a chance that they're gonna be in there. So we talked a little bit about this in the last slide, I guess I forgot I had one in here, that there's, there can be a difference in the preferences among species. So on the left would be more typical Indiana bat. They'd be in a tree where they're getting some nice solar exposure so trees that are dominant in the canopy or they've died and their own foliage is gone off the top, letting some sun in. Whereas northern long-eared bats tend to roost a little lower down on trees and in a really uh, heavy canopy closure. One really fascinating thing that a lot of people don't necessarily know about bats is that they have something called fission fusion roosting behavior. And that means they will switch around between what we would call a primary roost where most of the bats in the colony are on many of the nights. And then they'll have a bunch of secondary or what people might call satellite roosts. So bats will actually bounce around between these various roosts, almost like you having several different homes that you go between. And they'll do that maybe every night to five, six, seven nights on average, depending on the species. And those roots will be in kind of a network. And so it's important to think about the fact that, you know, doing forest management and removing some of those trees in the winter when bats aren't in them is really not a big concern. But um, I think I have it in a couple slides, but removing potentially all of those trees at one time would cause a big stress, presumably to the bats when they come back the next year and need to find all new roots because bats do have high site fidelity. So that means they come back to the same place year after year and they live a long time, which is another fact that people don't necessarily associate with such small mammals. Bats can live into their 20s and 30s. We can see a great example here of some roost switching in a rock roosting bat. So again, we're talking about maybe every one to five day on average for most of these species that they'll move. And those concentrations can vary by species. So this was over a pretty concentrated range here. You can see the measurement on the bottom of 100 meters. So we're just talking several hundred meters between all of these roosts. This was a bat we put a radio transmitter on. It was an Eastern small-footed bat. And it was roosting in some old unused slate piles, uh, tailings piles in an old slate quarry. And you can see how this bat started at the star, then it flew southeast, then it flew back northwest, and then north again, and then back southeast. That was for the length of the transmitter, which lasts about seven days and then falls off. And then all the other pink dots in there are also roosts because we were tracking two other bats and they used some of those other pink roosts and they used some of the same roosts that this bat did. So because of that fission fusion behavior, it means that if you have 10 to 100 bats in a colony, they don't all move at the same time when they're roost switching. 
So when we think about, um, again, what's important to bats, they're using different elements of the habitat for those different behaviors, whether it's foraging, roosting, or commuting. So it's important to keep in mind that there are a lot of interesting things you can do on your land that can benefit bats that you don't necessarily have to focus on just one of those elements of their habitat needs. So conserving potential roost trees in groups, maintaining travel corridors, and the diversity of classes and species is really important. And this is an example of what I was talking about with thinking about when we're clearing, if you're spreading that clearing out, either staggering it over time or making smaller cuts, then you could potentially remove say one roost at a time or maybe two or three roosts at a time. A bat comes back and let's say two or three out of its seven or eight roosts are gone it can just find a couple new roosts, which it, obvious, uh, which it usually is exploring and looking for anyway. And, uh, and that will be kind of a low stress. But if you cleared so much habitat at one time that you were to take everything in these two yellow circles, then when those bats return, they would probably find that um, they would spend a lot of time looking for new roosts and that could potentially delay their onset of their pregnancy and rearing of their pups and they might be using less suitable habitat. But bats also love structures. And this actually is what most of the questions coming in <laughs> were about uh, that I got leading up to the talk. And sometimes this results in some conflict between humans and wildlife. And it turns out that as a wildlife manager, most of your job tends to be managing humans and human behavior and not so much wildlife. But in this case, wildlife really have moved right into our homes very comfortably. So here you see a couple pictures. One is a bat house on a barn, another is looking up into a bat house. So you can see again how these bats really prefer to squeeze in like sardines. But some of the features that are important to them are to have a place that's up high, that's safe from predators, that um, usually is in a very warm and stable location. So that means that bats are in barns and attics and churches and up under slate roofs and even in bridges and things like that. So if they can find those features somewhere, they will inhabit that. And that really applies to two bat species mainly in Vermont, the big brown bat, which is sitting over here on the coffee can on the left. So I, I just wanna say that if you, ever, um, if you ever do meet a bat, please do not feed it coffee. They're supposed to be nocturnal, which means active at night. And this is what happens when you feed bat coffee during the day, it will be up all day, which is just exhausting for the poor thing. So, this was actually a bat that someone found down in Jamaica and they were getting into her home, uh, into her living space, which is not really where you want them. <laughs> so we do always put human safety and health first and try to avoid any of those direct con uh, contact situations. So we give a lot of great technical assistance and advice on how to get bats out safely. And one of the safe ways to evict them is in the spring and fall when they don't have pups, but they're actively coming and going to put in what's called a one-way door. That allows bats to get out, but not back in. And that might look like a tube or screening or something that the bats can go out, but not back in. And we have a lot of great resources for that. Um, feel free to look on our website. You can just type bats into the search window there and you'll find great resources on that. And also on exactly where and how to mount bat houses. You can also help by monitoring populations. These are all roost sites of bats that like to use structures. So again, we found them in bridges and uh, older and newer structures if they just have the right features in bat houses, bat houses that are freestanding or on barns, uh, behind shutters, under slate roofs, and the uh, people that, that have bats living in these situations often are kind enough to report those to us and we can investigate and figure out what species they have. We have set up a monitoring program, especially to monitor populations of endangered little brown bats, but we're also interested in counting big brown bats. So that means that as these bats exit the structures at dusk, we love to have citizen science, scientists and homeowners who have bats living there count the bats as they come out. And we have great survey protocols. Again, you can find this on our website or reach out to me by email. And you can participate in this. It happens in July, the last two weeks in July. And we just ask that you do four counts and fill out a pretty simple data sheet. It's essentially a staring contest in counting that. 
But that information that we've pooled and collected over time has allowed us to see some really hopeful population trends. And this trend information has been um, confirmed with similar monitoring programs at other states, though not widespread. States like Pennsylvania do not seem to be um, finding this trend for their little brown bats, but we have seen, seen some positive signs here. So the number of the bats is over on the left, and then on the bottom you can see the year. And um, 2019, somehow I didn't have the data for this graph, I apologize, but um, 2020 we, we put on hold so we're gonna start back up in 2021. We just didn't wanna uh, encourage people to gather together in 2020 just to be safe with COVID. But some exciting signs, and then we participate in a lot of research. And some of that has led to some exciting findings suggesting that little brown bats, although they are still getting sick in the winter from white nose, are really tolerating the disease well. And um, there may be some underlying genetic components that are really allowing them to make it through the disease and pass that on to their young, which is a very hopeful sign. So I'll just leave you with this um, slide. That's the, on the left is uh, my chainsaw and where I, I used to live down in Hubberton, but now I'm up in Bolton here. So if you're a neighbor, feel free to give a shout out. And on the right is a Northern long-eared bat as rare as they are, it's very exciting to see them. So I will, with that, stop sharing my screen. Turn my camera back on. Open up the chat box, but Kathleen, I don't know if you wanted to moderate the questions. I can certainly do that. Thank you so much, Alyssa. I, I actually have a question for you, and that is, when are we going to see bats emerge from hibernation? Aha! Uh -huh. I just got a report from Jim Andrews, who's down in Middlebury. He has a bat house, and he is very devoted to watching his big brown bats, and he says they're back in the bat house right now. Uh -huh. Very typical, big brown bats and eastern small-footed bats are usually the first bats to come out on the landscape. And um, big brown bats often we'll see during warm spells, they'll pop out. Even if they go back into hibernation when it snows again, they do tend to pop out in March. Excellent, thank you. And I will open up the chat here and see what we have for questions. I know there are a few. Um, Oh, and it's very hard for me to read these. Oh, and if you want, I can just I can just read and respond if you'd like, if that's easier, because I can see them. Can you see them? I can, yeah. Yep. Okay. And I have my glasses on, so that, that works out well. <laughs> right. Great. I can't with that. <laughs> uh, let's see. It looks like uh, Andrea said she had had a bat, um, thinking that it was a big brown, and it was in her folding table umbrella. And Andrea, that is a very common report that I get you are not alone. Um, as my aunt likes to say, it's, it's not original, unfortunately, I'm sorry to tell you, but that happens quite a bit. And it sounds like it fell out of the umbrella. She put it back up there carefully and closed the umbrella. How can you discourage that from happening? Um, the only way that I found is, is prevention. So uh, to take down your umbrella when you're not using it, because they tend to like those spaces to squeeze into. So I think the best way is just either leaving it open or taking it down when it's closed would be the easiest solution there. Uh, it looks like there's one from Susan. Oh, talking about the dire circumstances for uh, bat species in Vermont and elsewhere. Uh, why do we oppose the restrictions on pesticide spraying to limit the harm? to bat species that were recommended by the Vermont Endangered Species Committee? Oh yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so uh, my role in that, I, I don't make policy decisions or, uh, or give legal, legal advice, which were some of the big questions going on there. Um, my role was to look at the science and there is a lot of good evidence out there about um, other types of pesticides and their impacts on bats, specifically organochlorines, for example, if you think of things like DDT and stuff that was outlawed. Um, the two pesticides, the adulticides that were in question, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of good data on. And in fact, um, some of the only data that exists there 
uh, includes a couple of studies that were done where permethrin was sprayed inside of uh, bat roosts, and then the bats were observed over, I think, up to 16 weeks. And not only was the pesticide not detectable, but it actually um, it didn't seem to result in um, any concern for the bats. So as a scientist, I was tasked with finding out what the impact would be on bats. And, and I just wasn't able to dig up that information <laughs> to, to say that there was harm going on. Um, so that was just my role in that part. Um, was to look to see if PAKE was actually happening and, um, and I wasn't able to find that. So I'm not sure the decision lies with the secretary of the agency. And so she gets to decide taking all that information and the advice of the Endangered Species Committee and our commissioner and gets to make a decision there. Um, but certainly there are a lot of great options that the towns could take advantage of for you know, alternative ways of dealing with mosquitoes. And I would definitely encourage them to to look at some of those alternatives because it's a great, great that part of the state. It's very cool. Uh, let's see, Kathy says, um, oh, did you want me to give time for people to ask any other follow-ups or just go to the next? So why don't we just, yeah, go through the chat. Okay. Um, and then if we have time, we could we could take some follow-up. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Kathy says, will different species use the same roost? So in the winter, absolutely. Um, in caves and mines, we have multiple species that roost in the same site. Um, almost all of our underground sites, which we know of about 30, all have multiple species in them. So they hibernate together. Some of them roost right next to each other in hibernation, like little browns and northern long eared bats, sometimes Indianas. Um, in the summer, they don't tend to, except for little brown and northern long eared bats have been found in buildings together because northern sometimes use buildings. But for the most part, they separate out in the summer. And um, someone said big brown bats often use structures, but you didn't hear what other species. So big browns and little browns are the two that are usually in structures. Occasionally, northern long eared bats will use um, structures mm -hmm. as well. Um, but usually they'll segregate themselves, big browns and the smaller species. Uh, Elizabeth asks, do bats carry diseases that affect humans? The most famous of which would be uh, rabies. It's actually less than 1% of the natural bot population, probably about a half a percent that's infected with rabies, but obviously it's deadly. So we take those concerns very seriously. So um, don't go out and pick up a bat. <laughs> that's the best way to avoid getting getting bitten because um, they think that you're a big scary monster that's probably going to kill them. So I would say not to grab them and you probably will not get bitten. If you do find one in your home, please call the rabies hotline and they will advise you whether they think there's been any potential exposure or not. Those would include situations like a bat flying through your living space while you're asleep at night. So you don't know if there was contact, if there was direct contact, like a bite or a scratch. If the bat was in the room with um, an untended child, they might not want to stay and get in trouble if they had touched the bat. Or if your pets were involved, those are some situations. So they'll run you through some questions and find out whether they think the bat should be sent for testing. We do have rabies positive cases come up every year, usually um, maybe about three bats per year. Um, but because we're good at prevention in the United States, I believe that the average is two to three human deaths per year caused by rabies from any source. Um, raccoons and skunks, I think, rank higher in terms of rabies positive in the state every year than bats. Um, in terms of other uh, diseases, the um, if you have bats living in an attic or a barn or something and you want to clean that up or sweep that up, I would probably wear a mask um, and be very careful to ventilate the area very well. You can also spray it down with water. You would wanna look up something called histoplasmosis and the CDC has great information on their website. It's very uncommon up in the Northeast. It's more common in the Midwest and the Southeast but it's a fungus that grows on bird droppings and bat droppings. So the bats themselves aren't carrying it. It's a fungus that grows on them. Just the same as like cleaning out your chicken house. Um, we can carry some diseases that can impact bats though. So we canceled our field work last year because we were concerned that we would transmit SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, to bats. Um, we were concerned that they could be vulnerable to getting that from us because, um, because, the, uh, because there are a no number of other coronaviruses that have been traced back to bats in other parts of the world. 
and these are not viruses that our bats have ever seen before. So we were concerned about giving that to them. There's ongoing research to try to understand how vulnerable they might be. At this point, the research um, has shown that, uh, that uh, minks are, are extremely, extremely vulnerable. They can both contract the disease from us. And so whole European um, countries have, have essentially um, euthanized all of the mink on some of their farms because they were coming down with the disease and then spreading it back to people actually. Um, and they do get sick with the typical respiratory disease. Uh, let's see. Let me know if you think I'm giving too long answers here. So mm -hmm. the next one is, because I think there's just a couple questions left. Um, how long before, oops, I miss, what, what brand of bat house is the best? I think I see in there. That's um, so that is a uh, brand. I, I don't have a brand preference. There's uh, a couple sites that I've gone to before though. Uh, Bat Conservation and Management, I think is out of Pennsylvania. Um, there's one called like the Lone Star Bat Houses or something I found in line out of Texas. If you go to Bat Conservation International, it's batcon.org. They'll have all sorts of guidance on bat houses. Um, so they'll tell you the specifications you're looking for. And if you're on a website that sells bat houses, they can say on there that they're BCI, Bat Conservation International certified. Mm -hmm. And that means that they're building the houses to the specifications that are research tried and true. Um, lots of bat houses for sale. <laughs> yep, but also lots of criticism in terms of how much bats actually will use them. Yeah, and even if you buy the best of bat houses and you have good habitat and you put it in the right place, there's no guarantee bats will use it, but they do best on structures. They really don't do well on trees. You can put them on a post, but again, it's better on a structure. They tend to hold the heat better in a more stable environment like that. And multiple chambers is best. And we're talking big, not birdhouse size. The good bat houses are like two feet tall, by about a foot and a half wide with multiple chambers that are three quarters of an inch. How long before the baby bats are born? So bats, um, female bats store sperm over winter. They mate in the fall, store sperm over the winter. And then in the spring, they actually ovulate. And then that stored sperm fertilizes the egg and they start their pregnancy pretty much when they come out of hibernation. So for big brown bats, that's could be mid-March, late March, like now, even up here in the cold North, for um, Indiana little brown bats like that, they're coming out more mid to late April. So that's when they start their pregnancy and it's about a 60 day gestation. So we're seeing their pups born usually sometime in mid to late June. And then they can start flying as early as four weeks, but usually a little bit later. And then they go through a weaning process before they're out on their own. Is it helpful to put up bat houses and can I give tips for success? It is helpful, it's most helpful in places where bats are being evicted from structures. So if you know you have bats in an attic and you wanna get them out safely, it's really important to put up a bat house in that instance. Uh, there's a good chance your bats will just move to your neighbor's <laughs> attic if you kick them out of your place. Um, but you can just put them up if you know that bats are in the area. The importance is if you just see bats flying around, that could be any of the nine species. So if you know bats are roosting in structures, that's really what will be a good key. And um, a whole list of tips is available on our website as well in kind of a brochure form for the exact height and the sunny area and all that kind of stuff. Does our data apply to New Hampshire? Um, some of it, there are some differences for sure. They don't really have many known hibernacula and we do. Um, they also don't have many known little brown bat colonies left, so they don't have as good data on that. So in some ways, I think um, we, we seem to have uh, slightly better data there, but we share all the same species with the exception of Indiana bats. Indiana bats aren't in New Hampshire. Um, that was from Ezra. Allen asks, what are the implications of a change in climate, such as rising temperatures, precipitation changes, et cetera, on bats? Um, that's a great question, Alan. So I don't know if you're already familiar with the research that's been done on Indiana bats. You might be, and you're just asking this for everybody else too. Um, but, but yes, there has been some great modeling work done on Indiana bats to suggest, I don't have a graphic of this, but if you can picture that the Champlain Valley in Vermont where Indiana bats is, that is the Northeast tip of their current range. 
and then it spreads west and southwest from there is where their range is. So the modeling suggests that in the next 50, 100 years, that their range with climate change will start to move northeast. So instead of Vermont being at the edge of their range, Vermont will be more in the middle of their range at some point. So we would have Indiana bats more throughout different parts of the state as they have to move up to cooler climates. And there are some um, reports and some research going into bats overheating in bat boxes right now. So although we do usually recommend that people put the bat house on a really sunny side of the house, I would say the best bat house placement advice I can give you in terms of climate change is because we tend to have um, more or maybe hotter types of spells in the summer, bats can overheat. So multiple chambers mm -hmm. means that those back chambers give them room to get into a slightly cooler, maybe even five degrees cooler environment within the bat house. They can move around without even flying out. But putting a second bat house on a cooler or shadier side of the building or pole is actually a great, great um, strategy. So bats can actually move their pups and switch roosts really easily if it gets too hot. Um, and Alyssa, uh, can I follow up on that? Is, is there any evidence that a changing climate might impact positively or negatively the fungus that the bats are getting? Uh, so far, um, I have not seen anything to suggest that. Um, but it's possible that we just haven't collected enough information over time to see changes in underground temperature. So the sites where bats hibernate in the winter where the fungus grows, and it seems to grow in the same temperature that bat range that bats like to hibernate in, those are really stable sites. Mm -hmm. And they're well underground. So you can go in there in July and it's 40 degrees and you can go in in January and it's 40 degrees and it's stable most of the time. Mm -hmm. That's most of the sites, but it's not all of them. There are some that are probably on the edge of being really um, good sites, but bats are still loyal to them. So I think there's a chance with those sites that are shallower and smaller and their temperature does fluctuate a little bit more that climate change could impact some of those. There's also the chance that it could be beneficial to bats by having shorter winters where bats can come out and forage on insects more and not be hibernating for that long. But I think that um, we'll have to have a longer timeline of data collection to try to answer some of those questions. Right now, the surprising thing that's shown up with white-nose syndrome is even as it spread further south, all the way through those southeast states where bats don't hibernate for very long in comparison, right? Mm -hmm the effects were the same. 90% of the bats still died of the disease. And so that suggests that it's that the overall temperature, things like that, is not the driving factor there on the impacts to bats. But I, I think time will tell on that. And, um, and there are a lot of people smarter than me <laughs> looking into those questions. Um, my home's surrounded by woods, Nessa says, with some transit corridors, great old logging roads. In the spring, there's a vernal pool and some swamp land. Nice. Never thought about putting up bat houses, but there's plenty of natural habitat. And, and I would say, um, no, she's saying, should I rethink this? And I would say, no, I would focus on the natural habitat there. The concern about putting up bat houses or artificial structures in a place where they aren't, or you don't have structure dwelling bats for sure, is that you might potentially change the dynamic there. So you might be inviting little brown bats and big brown bats to move into an area where really there are tricolored bats and Indiana bats or some really tree roosting species. It could actually change the dynamic. So we usually don't suggest just throwing them out anywhere. Um, Elizabeth asks, any reason I can't just let the bats in the attic continue using it? I never go up there. You know, the, um, a lot of the countries over in Europe are much more conservation oriented and protective of their bats than we are. And they've just come out and say it, like leave those bats in your attic, don't touch them, leave them alone. We're not as comfortable with that in the United States. Um, the, the Canadian, my Canadian partners also seem to be giving that advice. Um, we, we seem to not like to tell people what to do in their homes in the United States, but yes, um, if you're not stirring up large 
piles of guano up there and breathing it in, then histoplasmosis is not a problem. If you're not in direct contact with the bats, then rabies is not a problem. So um, if they're not causing damage in some way, then I would say just to, just to leave them there. Uh, Walt asks uh, to post my contact information so that we can discuss NRCS wetlands grant. Oh yeah, very exciting. Shag bark and red, red maple retention. Oh, and bog turtles. Bog turtles, I don't know a lot about, but I can put you in touch with the right person for sure. So should I just type my email into the chat here so that it's right there for everybody to see? And then I can answer. I think there's maybe two more questions. Yes, please do. If, if you'd like folks to email you directly, that would be great. Right, yeah, that works really well. And and definitely feel free to go um, onto our website. Uh, I wear many different hats in my role. And so email can, uh, I can get kind of be behind on. So I apologize, but there's a lot of frequently asked questions on the website as well. Um, Hugh asks, uh, I have an old bat house that I made years ago. How's best to clean it of any harmful substances before I put it up again? Um, and I'm, so I'm not sure what the harmful substances might be that are in there. Um, if it was um, untreated wood, I think that you should be fine. Uh, definitely cleaning out wasps' nests and spider webs and things like that. If you're concerned that the wood was treated in some way that might not be good for bats, then it might be better to start over. Um, and that was some of the, that was why some of that research on permethrin was done is because it is um, not just used for mosquito spraying; it's actually used for uh, treating woods to keep insects out of the woods. And so, um, so some of the uh, European countries who use that were looking at that and a number of other pesticides to see what was harmful to bat. And it turns out at the end they actually recommended permethrin because it was it didn't seem to show an impact, whereas a lot of the other chemicals that were used in treating wood. Um, did so so it really like if you have any concerns go just go with the untreated wood that's um, like rough cut lumber you can build them out of rough cut lumber instead of even plywood um, and how can you differentiate bat species while they're flying um, it's very difficult if you have an acoustic detector and you're good at um, recognizing the acoustic signatures of bats you can differentiate most of them but not all of them in the air just by looking at their silhouettes, only a couple stand out. The tricolored bat has a very fluttery butterfly flight. Um, hoary bats uh, are very, they're our largest species and they're very fast, fast flyers out in the open. But really it's difficult just by looking at bats to tell them apart. Um, John says, I love how much you know. Thank you, John, that's very kind. Um, my email address is in there and you mentioned your website. What's the address? All right. Oh, and look at that, Alan put in uh, the website and, oh, meet the staff, okay. And I and um, if you just go to vtfishandwildlife.com, the fastest way to get to the bat stuff is just type bats in the search part of the window and it'll bring up everything from how to participate in citizen monitoring, how to site your bat house, um, all sorts of great resources like that. Um, if you want to have a colony and you want to report it, we have online forms for that, so you can go ahead and do it. So I will hand it back over to Kathleen to see if there's anything else. Oh my goodness, well, Alyssa, thank you so much. We are at 6.30, um, perfect timing. I really um, enjoyed your presentation, um, I learned a lot. I'm, I'm eager to see if I'm gonna have bats in my woods and all those dead trees that I've left here. Um, because I've never really looked for them. <laughs> so now I will. Um, so we've got your contact information. Uh, lots of kudos in the chat box. Thank you so much. So knowledgeable. Um, I'm really pleased that you did this for us. Vermont Woodlands Association likes to bring lots of programs to landowners. So if you're, if you're with us tonight and you're not a member, please visit our website have to do a little shameless self-promotion here for VWA. So vermontwoodlands.org, check us out. We have lots of great resources and lots of other um, webinars to offer. One of Alyssa's colleagues at Fish and Wildlife is gonna do a bear presentation in a couple of weeks. So um, that's gonna be fun as well. So Alyssa, thank you so much. Uh, um, Thank you for the invitation. I greatly appreciate everyone's finding time out to, 
to attend. Thank you. Oh, it was great. Great. Nice group. Alan Thompson, if you're still with us, is there anything you want to say to wrap us up? Just a, a, another big thank you to you, Kathleen, for organizing this and to you, Alyssa, for, for joining us and to all the, the folks willing to come out on a beautiful, beautiful Thursday <laughs> evening. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Have a good night. Good night, folks. Thank you.